difference, which pisses me off, but webinar is being recorded. Oh, there's a lot of people there. Yes, so everybody can attend and can tap. Um, okay, it's three o'clock. We're going to get started shortly. If you could please put your um, location in the chat box, that would be greatly appreciated. It gives us an idea of who's here. Um, we have quite a few people I know. Missouri is here. Okay, that's cool. South Carolina, Alabama, Wisconsin. There's lots of different people. Lexington, Kentucky. I hope you are with power, I assume, if you're here. Storm is going to be here shortly. <laughs> the next one, anyway. Connecticut, Oregon. Pat Patterson's one of our things. California. We don't get very many from California, so that's always nice. Okay, so while you guys are doing that, it is three o'clock, so we will um, try to start on time. Uh, my name is Dr. Jackie Jacob, and I am one of two extension specialists here at the um, University of, Flor of Kentucky. God, I was saying. Um, as part of my job, I organize these monthly meetings. I coordinate the um, Small and Backyards Flocks Community of Practice on e-extension, uh, which has the articles, the webinars, and things like that. And so uh, we've been doing this for seven, eight years now. We were just trying to figure that out how long it had been. Um, and uh, so we have lots of recordings. Everything is recorded and will be posted on our um, uh, YouTube page if you want to watch recordings of past webinars. Um, and this, uh, I will be monitoring the chat box and the Q&A. If you have a question, if you're like me, you forget it if you don't ask it right away. So feel free to uh, type it in. Uh, to either the chat box or the Q&A. If it's a clarification of what the speaker's talking about, then I will um, I will uh, interrupt. Um, otherwise, we'll hold the questions to the end. So we have a backyard flock owner uh, with her daughter who um, is going to be giving us an overview of what it's like to be a backyard uh, chicken owner. So um, I will be on mute um, and with my video off. And uh, as I said, I will monitor the chat and the Q&A. Feel free to put in your question. If it's uh, you know important to clarification, I will interrupt. Otherwise I'll keep my mouth shut. Um, so, uh, the, our speaker today is Megan from, uh, Nebraska, uh, Extension Department of, T of Transportation, but she, um, uh, is a backyard chicken owner. So she'll give us her perspective on being a backyard chicken owner. Thank you very much, Megan, for joining. I will go on mute and this is all yours. All right. Thanks everybody for joining us today. Um, we'll start out just a little bit about me. So as Jackie mentioned, I do work for Nebraska Extension, but um, my job's funded by the DOT and I do transportation extension. Um, outside of that, I am a lifelong Nebraska farmer and we have had a backyard flock for about eight years now. Um, it started as a 4-H project. Um, both my husband and I have ag ed degrees, though neither of us are high school ag teachers anymore. And when our oldest was getting ready to move from being a clover kid, or we call them clover kids, some states call them clover buds, um, into being a full-fledged 4-H member, we decided she needed a livestock project. And, um, you know, sat around the kitchen table and debated what the options were. And landed on chickens, either, even though neither of us had ever owned a chicken before. So um, it, it 
it definitely is something that's an easy entry point if you want to be a backyard flock owner. Um, the cost of acquisition for housing and supplies and the animals themselves is more affordable than some of the other larger animal species. Um, today, you'll actually see some video clips from my two. This picture's a couple of years old, but um, Anne, Anne is the oldest and Henry is the, the little one. And they both um, raise chickens and show chickens through 4-H and through American Poultry Association uh, activities. Our current coop population, I asked for an inventory the other day. Um, she said she thinks there's 42 birds in the coop and we're hatching. And I think there's about 40 chicks in the basement. There were eight in the incubator when I left home a, a bit ago. And then there's about another 120 eggs in there um, that'll hatch sometime in the next couple of weeks. So we're, we, we went a little beyond the, the cute little coop and the eight chickens we thought we were going to have. So, um, be forewarned, be forewarned. Um, as I go on today, I'm going to share some links in the chat box uh, to extension resources that we have found valuable, that we have bookmarked and correlate to different things um, that I'm going to talk about. So feel free to watch for those. Oh, it keeps making me want to open them to share them. Are you having trouble? All right, got it. Okay. Okay, so today we're gonna start out your first chickens. Um, you have some choices and we'll talk a little bit about uh, what kinds of chickens you might start with and some pluses and minuses, where you might find those chickens. Um, then we'll go into some basics about particularly what they need, um, housing, um, food, water, um, some kind of basic care types of things. We'll talk a little bit about handling your chickens and um, that's where the kids come in. They've got a couple of videos they're gonna share. The oldest one was gonna help out today, um, but she ended up having a track meet. So she's actually throwing the shot put right about now. Um, then we'll kind of go through tasks that we do every day um, and tasks that are weekly. <clears throat> we'll talk about what happens when you need to be gone. Uh, whether it's a quick overnight kind of thing or for an extended period of time, um, what kinds of things to keep in mind. And then we'll talk a little bit about some seasonal care. With seasonal care, um, I will add the caveat that I live in Nebraska, so we have four distinct seasons. And actually in the spring, we joke about how it's like a new season every day. Um, today it's in the mid fifties and we've got a light, by the Great Plains standards, a light breeze. Um, it was 80 one day last week, and it was also 29 one day last week. So we we sometimes have all the seasons in one one week in the spring. Um, but we'll talk about some things to kind of keep in mind or, or have on your radar at different times of the year. All right. So your first chickens. Um, <clears throat> this is Squirt. Squirt is now um, uh, a hen that lays and likes to sit on some eggs. So we have... Lots of, lots of junior squirts. When you decide to start your flock, you could start with eggs that you hatch in an incubator yourself. You could start with chicks. I think that's where a lot of, um, we'll call ourselves chicken people, start. Um, a trip to a local farm store, tractor supply or bomb guards is very dangerous for us this time of year. We sometimes end up with some unplanned acquisitions. Um, chicks are, you know, already hatched. You don't have to have special equipment at least, um, to hatch them. They are relatively inexpensive depending on what kind you want. And there are oodles of varieties available, um, whether from a local farm store or you can order, um, from many different hatcheries across the United States or individual breeders, um, as well. The <clears throat> chickens are really cool in that when they first hatch, uh, one of the last things that happens before they emerge from the egg is that they actually absorb the yolk. Um, the chick grows on the yolk. It isn't, it isn't the yolk. And so they've got 
some pretty good energy source than uh, for a couple of days. So the United States Post Office has been shipping freshly hatched chicks um, for over a century and it works. It's pretty efficient and kind of cool. You can't do that with a baby calf. Um, you might decide that chicks are a lot of work because they have to be warm and they go through some stages and you're feeding an animal for a long time before it's going to give you any eggs. And so you may opt to adopt or purchase mature birds that are already laying or ready to lay um, for your flock and start that way as well. You'll want to look at what's available um, to you. Cost, um, again, chick chicks are far cheaper than uh, a full-size laying hen. Um, accessibility, what's in your area um, or what are you willing to pay to have shipped to you? What kind of facilities do you have? Um, baby chicks need to be at a warmer temperature. So when they first come out of the incubator, we try to keep them at about 95 degrees and then slowly back off that temperature as we as they grow and as they get feathers and we get ready to move them out to the coop. But, you know, I've I got a whole bunch of chicks in my basement and that's not everybody's gig. Um, mine happens to be unfinished, so that helps. You may decide just to go straight to the coop and get bigger birds um, for that as well. So a decision that there's lots of pluses and minuses, but everybody figures out what works best um, for them. Again, those baby chicks, um, they need some care. So some of those, I'm going to share some links again with some extension resources that will hopefully help you um, if you're making that choice or that decision. Um, I, In particular, I like this one from Oregon State University. Um, it, it's a pretty simple, easy to follow guide and it's it's been helpful for us and as we've helped mentor um, some other 4-H families in our area. Um, I work for Nebraska Extension, but I use all land-grant institutions as resource bases. So you'll see me share um, resources from a lot of different universities. It's not a particular endorsement for one university or another. Your local land grant might have similar resources. This just happens to be the one that I found and, and we find useful. Um, if you have a flock or down the road, at, once you've established your flock, at some point, you're going to need to figure out how to integrate new birds into your flock. Uh, maybe they're chicks that you hatch and grow out in a brooder. Maybe they're um, you know, adult birds that you, or older chicks that you purchase and bring into your flock. Um, a couple of things I want you to keep in mind. First of all, please, please, please quarantine those birds. Keep them in a separate space um, where they are away from your flock for a minimum of 14 days. Um, I know a lot of breeders in our area recommend at least a month. Um, that way, if that bird has some type of illness that you're not aware of when you acquire it, that you hopefully can prevent spreading that to your whole flock. Um, we we show birds um, because my kids are in 4-H. And a couple of years ago, we were at a, a local um, APA poultry show and a lot of our birds were there. Um, and we purchased a pair of birds on, on the silent auction. And because so many of our birds were at the show, we put everybody in the coop and we ended up losing, I think 18 birds uh, from a respiratory virus that we acquired at the show. So we, um, I, I cannot urge you not to quarantine enough. Um, it's a, pain to have two separate spaces, but very valuable in protecting the health of your birds. Um, when you're doing your daily bird chores that we'll talk about later, take care of your main flock first, then take care of your quarantine birds. So you're not caring for the quarantine birds, getting whatever they have on your clothing and carrying that out to your coop. Um, save your quarantine birds, whether they're uh, new birds or birds at the in the chicken hospital um, quarantine space, 
that um, you don't want to carry those out to the coop. Um, the trick that works best for us, we've tried lots of different things. You know, there's lots of chatter about this in, you know, in the Facebook groups and on the blogs. Um, the trick that works for us is to add new birds at night after the flock has roosted. Um, one of the things I'll probably mention a couple of times, we're continually reminding ourselves as cool as chickens are and as many interesting instincts as they have, um, they don't have very big brains. So they, if, if they're asleep and they wake up and there's a new bird, they're just part of the flock. They can't count. So they don't know that there were eight birds yesterday and nine today. Um, you can sneak in a new bird at night pretty easily. All right, so we'll transition to some chicken basics. So just like any animal, including us humans, there are some, some core things that chickens need. And a lot of these um, I've grouped under housing because they're gonna be in a defined space at least some of the time. And with that, we're gonna start with safety. They need some type of housing we'll call it a coop, that's going to protect them from the weather. We have different kinds of weather. So in Nebraska, sometimes of the year, I'm trying to keep them from freezing because it's really cold. Sometimes of the year, I'm trying to keep them from being too hot because um, we get some hot, humid weather in Southeast Nebraska. Um, depending on where you're at, you may have more concern with one or the other. So I have chicken friends that live much farther south of me that don't really worry about cold because they rarely get any snow and it rarely drops below about 25 degrees. So their housing is a lot more temporary feeling. Um, it doesn't have some of the same insulation and uh, protection that we need to withstand those winter temperatures, but they have a lot better ventilation than I do. Um, and so sometimes in the summer, we have to, to do some extra measures to, to make sure our coop is ventilated, like leave the primary door open with a screen door in place so that they still get ventilation um, and air uh, to, to not get too hot. Predators are a major concern. Um, there's lots of different types of housing. You might have a permanent coop that sits in one spot with a permanent outdoor space that's protected. That's what we have because we also share our acreage with foxes and hawks and eagles and lots and lots of weasels, lots of animals that like to eat um, or kill our birds. And so we don't do a lot of free ranging. It's very supervised um, and small groups at a time at our house because of the predator of the predator threat. Um, so you'll need to assess the predators that you have in your area, um, usually talking to other local um, poultry enthusiasts or your local extension office um, will, will give you some clue to that. They're most susceptible to predator risk at night. Um, a lot of animals that prey on birds like chickens are very active night hunters. So you may be able to free range during the day and close up your birds at, in the coop at night um, and keep them safe and have very low death loss that way. Um, we need a space that's free from something that's going to injure the birds. We want to make sure that you know we don't have a nail sticking up out of the floor that they might be curious about and, and get scratched on or um, any other kind of you know loose hanging wire from the, the mesh that you see in the photo. Um, those are things that could could cause an injury to a bird. And in some places, theft is a concern. Um, while acquiring birds and, and um, even very nice competitive show birds can uh, be a lot cheaper than some other livestock species, you're gonna have a fair amount of money invested in your, your birds and your supplies. Um, a friend at a poultry show this fall told me she was offered $10,000 for a single pullet. Um, I've yet to raise a bird that's that's worth that much, but you know we've all got goals, right? So what kind of security do you need um, to prevent theft options in, or theft risk in your neighborhood? Food and water. 
Um, birds need access to clean water 24 hours a day, um, all the time. Food, there's kind of some mixed thoughts on this, um, and there are mixed thoughts in the literature too. It's not, um, I want to distinguish between research verified sources like the extension articles that I'm sharing versus the things that anecdotally you'll read. Um, you know, you can't trust everything you read on the internet. There's usually more than one right answer. And in this case, um, we leave food um, access to our birds all the time, again, because they don't free range. So they don't have that opportunity to seek out their own food. Some people um, have food available part of the day and they pull the food uh, maybe overnight. One of the things you need to keep in mind is that the pecking order is real. Um, even if you have a small flock and very friendly birds, there's some kind of hierarchy. And the birds higher in the hierarchy may restrict the access to the food space or the waterer from the birds lower on the hierarchy. And so having it available longer periods of time gives everyone an opportunity to get the nutrition and the water that they need. One of the things we often have to remind um, the, the children, chicken keepers at my house is that we want to make sure that most of their diet is the formulated chicken feed that we purchase. Um, they love treats. They love mealworms. They love black sunflower seeds. They love fruits and vegetables. Um, they're even happy to pick the last bits of turkey off the turkey carcass at Thanksgiving. But we want to make sure that they're getting all the vitamins and minerals they need, and they get that from their formulated feed. So to make sure that we don't overwhelm them with treats and throw their diet off, off balance. They need, they need access to light and air. Even though our, our birds are in a secure space, they still have time outside um, they still have access to natural light whenever we have natural light. Um, <clears throat> we do um, supplement some with some artificial light um, as we're moving into breeding season in the spring to trigger egg production just a little bit earlier because of our county fair schedule so that we have chicks that are ready to show um, and, and a size that's desirable. We need them to start laying in the spring just a little bit earlier. So we do have access to artificial light in our coop. Some people do, some people don't. Um, that's a decision that you can evaluate and make depending on your, your particular needs. Um, our coop has a lot of windows. It has a lot of opportunity for ventilation um, and is situated so that our prevailing winds come from the north and the west. So those winds can blow through our coop, um, again, to provide that ventilation when we have all of the windows open in the winter when we don't want those cold, bitter winds and blizzard conditions to blow into the coop. We close the windows on those north and west sides and uh, leave some windows cracked open on the east and the south to allow for ventilation and evaporation of any moisture that might accumulate in the coop, but also protect them from those cold temperatures. You'll need some kind of bedding. Um, you have lots of choices available. Um, pine chips are readily available at most farm stores. They're relatively inexpensive. Um, I, I see more and more conversation about a wood pellet, typically marketed as a horse bedding, um, that backyard flock owners like if you're using any type of wood product whether it's pine chip whether it's wood chips or wood pellets you need to make sure that it's not cedar cedar smells great i love it in woodworking projects but it is not okay it is toxic to chickens um, so they will show a lot of signs of illness and failure to thrive and possibly even die um, if exposed to cedar chips so make sure your wood products are cedar free um, the photo here, um, some people use straw. We don't have a good source of straw, um, so that's not a choice that works for us, but um, it is popular. Um, it It's particularly popular in colder climates in the winter because um, it traps a little bit more heat 
in it than some of the other options. Um, you'll also see a lot of coop owners that use sand as a, excuse me, as a choice, particularly in the run. Um, sand can be a, a great option for, you're, you'll have to clean it kind of like you would with kitty litter. Um, you can't just scoop it all out, compost it, and put new um, new bedding in, uh, which tends to be our preferred method. I've got a couple of options, um, a couple of resources for you related to what do you do with that waste? Whatever bedding you use, um, your chickens are going to, you know, every animal poops. And so when you start your flock, you need to have a plan for what you're going to do with that waste. If you live in a municipality, most municipal trash companies don't want pet waste um, or chicken waste in the trash can. It's also a very valuable resource. It's composts and makes wonderful garden um, and landscaping uh, supplemental fertilizer. It does need to be composted to do that. So some of the resources I shared will talk about um, different ways to compost. A full size standard um, size chicken, adult chicken will produce about two cubic feet of waste per year. So as your chicken numbers add up, so do the amounts of waste that you need to have a plan for um, and to deal with. If you also happen to be a gardener, you want to make sure you only put composted chicken bedding and waste in your garden. Um, chicken waste can have salmonella, E. coli, um, some other bacteria that you aren't going to want on vegetables that you are harvesting. That would be not would not be a safe situation. So we always want to make sure we compost anything that we put in the garden. Depending on how many birds you have and the size of those birds, they're going to need a different amount of space. This is out of a Penn State um, extension publication that I've already shared the link to. So obviously the smaller the bird, the less space that they need. Uh, and we have both indoor space and outdoor space here on the slide. So keep that in mind as you're planning. This is if you have a, a contained run, um, not if you're open, free ranging, they're going to have, usually going to have more space available than what is on the chart. In your coop, you should have some type of roost. Most chickens prefer to sleep elevated, so they're going to want a roost bar or um, structure of some type that they can they can roost on. We raise a variety of breeds. Um, I should have mentioned that earlier. You'll, the, in the photos with the kids on the first slide, you saw them with silkies, and you'll see some of those silkies again um, as time as we go on. That's those were our gateway bird, um, kind of like you know their gateways to other vices. Ours were silkies. Uh, we currently raise and show um, and breed silkies, creve coeurs, which are a French breed. Um, white-faced black Spanish, um, which are a Spanish breed that's critically endangered here in the United States. Um, and we have some Bantam Rhode Island Reds as well. And then we have a general population flock of laying hens that are an assortment of breeds. Some are identifiable APA recognized breeds. Some of them are more commercial laying oriented um, birds like red stars. Um, because we want lots of different colors of eggs. Um, so our most of our laying hens roost. Um, silkies sleep in a puddle on the floor uh, for the most part. We have one that sleeps on top of the water. Um, she kind of lives on top of the water, but they don't fly very well. So they need much lower roost bars than um, like our crev cores and our leg urns. Uh, like to roost in the rafters. The the roosting bars aren't high enough for them. They roost even higher. So they'll find their space that makes them happy uh, in the coop. You'll also need some place for them to hopefully lay you some eggs. Um, <clears throat> the 
Nesting boxes. Um, this is a pretty traditional nest box um, in the photo that you know people bought um, from places like the Sears catalog on a hundred years ago. They're still available at your local farm stores, or you can buy vintage ones on on local market places and, and auction places. There are also lots of cool ideas of ways to build out of wood or to repurpose um, items for chicken root or chicken nesting boxes. Um, there's a great one that uses kitty litter boxes or kitty litter buckets or five gallon buckets. Um, you can build them out of pallets, lots of choices. One of the things that frustrates nearly every chicken owner is, okay, so the nesting box, the standard nesting box um, that we have in our cube has like, I think 12, it's three layers or three rows of, of four columns of boxes. So we have 12 boxes. All 20-ish laying hens lay in three boxes, okay? You can't assign them. They will figure it out on their own. They'll make their own decision. They like to lay eggs together. It's it's a team sport, I guess. So again, you'll you'll kind of figure out where um, where their preferences are. The silkies don't lay in the in the nesting box. They they lay in a corner. Um, they also like to sit on them. They're very broody birds. So um, so they want to make sure that they are. Um, uh, you know, they've got all their eggs in their clutch together. So every, every breed and every bird is just a little bit unique that you'll figure out. We could do, in fact, there have been, um, I'd encourage you to go back and watch some of those past webinars about biosecurity, a couple of really basic things to get you started. Again, I can't emphasize enough quarantine new birds before you introduce them to your existing flock, if you have one. Um, and in doing so, care for your existing flock first, then care for those quarantined birds. Uh, dedicated coop footwear is really important. Um, they're a little bit messy, so we kind of like the, the boots, but whatever footwear you wear, um, those should just be coop shoes. We can transmit a lot of diseases that chickens could potentially get in and out of the coop um, on our shoes. And the 2014 outbreak of avian influenza we had in the United States, um, a lot of the spread amongst commercial flocks was actually because uh, people transmitted them from one barn to another on their shoes. So the, like the, the coop boots that we have at home only go to the coop. They never go to the fair. They never go to a friend's house. They don't go to the sledding hill. They're just uh, for the coop. Limit guests, particularly guests that also have poultry um, to your poultry space. Wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands. Um, yeah. When you take care of the coop, come in, wash your hands, take care of the quarantine birds um, before you make dinner, before you grab something out of the fridge before you brush your teeth. These are all things we've had to talk about at our house. You should wash your hands if you've touched your chickens. Um, also avoid touching your face at the same time that you're, you're touching chickens. Be extra careful with smaller children. There are um, you know, cases of illnesses that are transferred from birds to birds and also birds to humans. So we wanna be on top of that. Okay, shifting gears just a little bit, um, handling chickens. So this is where I enlisted our chicken keepers. Um, I've got three videos of things that they thought you might wanna know how to, to handle your birds and do. Hello, my name is Zan Niger and this is Snowy. And today I will be showing you how to properly pick him up. Just like all animals, birds want to feel secure. So hold their wings, support under their body, and you'll see that they're a lot more comfortable being held. All right, so this is Henry. Hi. Uh, 
uh, this is Snowy, and today I'll be telling you how to check if your bird is healthy or not. If it's a bearded, then you then for mites, you'll look here, just move around the feathers, and you'll look in the boots and around the wings. And to check if he has lice, uh, then you just move this up and look for the booty. <laughs> And we check if he has bumblefoot, you pick him up and then look at the bottom of his feet. And if it's swell, then he has bumblefoot. Ha. All right. And lastly, go. Hello, my name is Anna Niger, and today I'll be telling you how to see if your chicken plays eggs. So <laughs> you're going to want to hold her so that her legs are in between your legs, are in between your fingers like this, so that she doesn't scurve away. And one way to tell is by looking at her legs. The more pale they are, the more likely she lays. See, hers are pretty pale because that pigment is going into the yolk. So that's a good sign. But you're also going to want to check. So you're going to find the two pin bones. They're right here and right here. And then you're going to want to put your fingers in between them and see how wide it is. So she's about two fingers, which is okay. And then there's going to be the tip of keel bone over here and you're going to find that and you're going to line your fingers up with the bottom of the pin bones and the top of the keel bone so that's about three fingers so she's a pretty decent layer you're welcome they're siblings um she has been on a two-time state champion for each poultry judging team and one of the things they do is evaluate hens um, for effectiveness one of the questions that pops up a lot, particularly when our birds are first starting to lay their first eggs, is which which birds laying which eggs? And so she thought you might like to be able to check. Um, again, protect your bird's health, but protect your own health. Um, this is what the Salmonella um, bacterium looks like. So wash your hands a lot, avoid touching your face, wash your eggs and store them properly. Um, sanitize surfaces where you've had chickens, where you've had um, unwashed eggs, particularly in your house. All right, so a day in the life. Daily tasks. Um, you know, we're checking food, we're cleaning and checking waters every day. Uh, we gather eggs every day. When it's really hot, we gather, or really cold, we try to gather eggs two or three times a day so they're not in the coop at really high temperatures or temperatures where they might freeze. Um, we do a quick facility check, kind of walk around the space. Is there um, any evidence where uh, maybe a bored bird has has worked on some of the wires wire um, paneling from the inside or a predator has worked on trying to get in? Um, so that we can make repairs and keep the coop in good working order and keep the birds safe. We also do a general health analysis. So as we're in the in the coop doing chores, is there anybody that is sneezing? Is there anybody that has watery eyes? Um, is there anybody that's not behaving like they normally do? Um, those are all signs, early symptoms that um, someone might be coming down with something. Um, if we do notice some symptoms, we'll take that bird and put them in usually a dog crate um, in a separate space so that they can go into quarantine for observation and or treatment if needed. Um, <clears throat> if you let your birds out um, to free range or restrict their ability to be in their outdoor space, you'll want to make sure you let them out in the morning and lock them up in the evening. There are some, you know, sensor activated um, coop doors that you can use as an option if your schedule is not consistent enough to let them in and let them out um, at the same time on a, on a daily basis. Um, once a week, we try to kind of spruce up the bedding. We don't do a complete change out every week. But if there are some spaces like under the roost bars that are particularly nasty, um, we'll clean those out. We try to handle each bird about once a week for a basic health assessment, uh, a closer look at their eyes and face, 
um, you know, are they weighing about the same? Are they losing weight? Uh, and this is just an informal assessment. We don't actually take out a scale and weigh every bird, but as you handle them over time, you'll you'll kind of get the feel of them and and what their normal behaviors are and and what their normal um, normal weight is. Okay, we can't always be home. Sometimes we need to be able to step away from the coop. So what do we do? Um, it's a little bit of a challenge to find someone who is able to do your chicken chores when you are not, um, when you're not available to do it. And so oh, this, this link actually went with an earlier slide. Sorry. Um, not everybody's excited about it. Not everybody's willing to do it. Again, biosecurity is a concern. So it might be a friend or family member who lives nearby, a neighbor. Um, I see lots of conversations in some of the local chicken um, and poultry Facebook groups that I'm in where people volunteer to help one another out. Um, it's nice if they have an understanding of birds, if they need to do some more of the... Um, Oh, what I want to say, some of the, you know, deeper tasks, like some of those health check kinds of things or respond in an emergency. Um, you may be able to find a professional pet sitter, um, just like someone would come and stay and take care of your dog. They may be willing to come and stay or visit your, your farmer household um, once or twice a day to take care of your chickens. Um, it, it takes a little bit of work to find uh, someone who's willing to take care of them. And it it may cost you money. It's a service you might have to pay for. Um, it's good to have a, a primary person. And then it's always good to have a backup too in case something happens if you're going to be gone longer. Our system is set up so we can um, leave for like a weekend. We have enough feeder and water space that... Um, we've been pretty successful leaving for a little bit and then, uh, you know, a couple days. And when we get back, we usually toss the eggs and um, start again. But if we're going to be gone for more than two days or a weekend, that's when we bring in somebody to do at least a once daily check. Okay, seasonal things. So I thought I'd start with spring since we're in the spring. Um, this is the time when we do a full deep clean of the coop. Um, we clean everything out. We check for repairs that we might not be able to see when, when there's bedding in the coop. Um, we make sure that everybody's got a fresh start um, to bedding. Egg production will pick up as the days get longer, as we're in the spring season. So you need a plan for those eggs. I know everybody's like, oh, it'd be great just to have a couple eggs every day. Those eggs really start to add up. We didn't realize we don't actually eat that many eggs until we got chickens. So are there people in your family, in your neighborhood, at your workplace, in your community organization or your faith community that might like a dozen eggs once in a while? Um, in Nebraska, and these rules are going to vary from state to state, um, you'll need to check with your state Department of Agriculture. In Nebraska, if I'm going to sell eggs, whether it's you know at a formal market, at a farmer's market, or at a store, or if I'm going to sell them just to my neighbor, or if I'm going to donate them to a food bank, um, for example, I have to have an egg number. So that's a simple phone call to our Department of Ag. They'll go through the instructions. They'll issue us a number. All of any box of eggs that I, or carton of eggs that I um, sell or donate has to have that egg number and my contact information on the, um, as well as the date that they're packed on the carton. Um, so that if someone, you know, ends up with my eggs and there's an issue, they know how to find me um, so that we can try to try to rectify that situation. Uh, <clears throat> spring is a good time to consider if you are going to add more birds to your flock. Um, 
And if you're going to do that, how are you going to do that? If Are you going to hatch eggs like we are? Are you going to buy them from a local store? Um, those types of, uh, if you're going to look, work, look for a breeder, um, spring's a great time. Birds are laying, um, breeders are producing eggs. Farm stores have, um, farm stores have birds available. Hatcheries have chicks available. So it's a good time to do that. Um, I added deworming on to each of the quarters. There's a couple of different schools of thoughts um, related to worming and, and the schedule there. So that's, um, it's some of the articles I shared have some information about some general health things. And that's one that you'll want to uh, do some more investigating in. In the summer, our biggest concern in Nebraska is to watch for heat stress. Um, it's also a time when we're integrating a lot of new birds because those spring hatch hatches are getting to the stage where they're ready to move into the coop. Um, and then again, I added the deworming. In the fall, it's a good time to decide, you know, how many birds do you want to overwinter? Are you thinking you need to get some new birds in the spring? So if you're going to downsize um, any birds in your flock, fall is a typical time to do that. Um, in the livestock industry, we call that culling, C-U-L-L. -L. And when you cull birds, there's a variety of places that they could go. Um, you might rehome them to another backyard flock owner. You might sell them at a local livestock auction or um, animal swap um, event. You might harvest them and enjoy, you know, a, a chicken stew or a roast chicken um, sometime in the winter or make stock or, or one of those kinds of things. So you have some options if you choose that it, it's time for a bird to leave your flock um, for what you do with that bird. You also want to start your preparations for winter. Um, does your coop need any updates that are going to make it more weather tight um, for, your, for any winter weather that you might have? Um, etc. In the winter, our biggest challenge is cold stress and frostbite, particularly like this um, this rooster here has a large single comb. Um, you know, we have to be careful to keep those warm or warm enough that they don't get frostbite. Um, feet also could be a frostbite issue. So um, you'll want to do some extra health checks in the winter to make, particularly if you're having a cold snap, um, to make sure that you don't have frostbite risk. Keeping water thawed um, is a challenge. If you're fortunate enough to have power in your coop, there are lots of different waterers that have heaters built into them to um, keep that water thawed so that they can drink as needed. Whether to heat your coop or not heat your coop is a pretty hot button issue amongst chicken uh, backyard flock owners. Um, we did not heat our coop for a really long time. We, those, uh, I mentioned we have white faced black Spanish. They're a Mediterranean breed. They have giant combs and giant earlobes. And we just had a lot of frostbite issues that we didn't feel comfortable with. Um, so we did add some heat panels to the space in the coop where the Spanish, um, the Spanish are housed just to, to protect those combs um, and those earlobes a little bit more. But that is a hot topic. Um, you're also going, you can have lice and mites any time of the year. Um, our summer last year, everyone in our neighborhood, in our general area um, with chickens really fought lice and mites all winter long or all summer long last year. But they tend to be a bigger issue in the winter where birds are cooped up more, maybe they're a little closer together in a little less space, we tend to see more lice and mites. So be extra vigilant in the winter, but that's also something you probably need to be on top of uh, year round. All right, with that, I saw some activeness in the chat box. Um, I have one more group of documents to share. And are there any questions? Um, there weren't a lot of questions, though. Somebody said something about not being able to find a good drinker. Um, 
I always like nipple drinkers, but what's your opinion on drinkers? Um, we've done a few. We like the nipple drinkers too. We've had more problems keeping them thawed in the winter. So um, they are, they stay way cleaner though than more of a, um, I'll actually go back to that slide. That nipple had a drinkers are a closed system. So they provide cleaner water. Yeah. So here, um, this picture that's in the middle is a system where the water's in the blue pipe and then the bird actually um, activates the water and um, the water comes out of the nipple um, by moving that little um, metal piece. It's a little hard to see in the slide, um, as opposed to the water on the right that is more like an open trough um, kind of system. Um, I was very careful to find pictures of both feeders and waterers where they were elevated. Um, ideally, you want their feed or water source to be about the same height as the back of the chicken, um, whatever size chickens you have in that particular pen or coop. And they'll, they're a lot less likely to sit on them and, and uh, roost on them, as well as um, kick up things from the floor of the coop in either feed or water that way. Um, the particular ones that we landed on that have the heaters built in that are um, more reliable, we had problems with a few that like they'd work really great for about six weeks and then there'd be some power surge and we'd have to start over again. Um, we have we have little wooden boxes that they sit on because they don't they're not designed to hang um, so that they are at that appropriate height for whatever pen they're in. Um, sometimes in the blogs or on Facebook groups, you'll see people recommend um, the heated dog waterers or even a cheap crock pot from a thrift store. Um, because those are open on the top, um, first of all, they evaporate a lot. So keeping water in them can be challenging. Um, because of, of that evaporation issue. And birds are going to sit on them, they're gonna jump in them, they're gonna roost on the edges and they're gonna poop in that water. And it gets really gross really fast. And then you've got a heated situation, particularly that crock pot, cause that's a lot warmer than the dog water. You are literally cooking bacterial soup. Um, they are so gross. Um, yes, they do work but they require a lot of cleaning and a lot of maintenance um, in order to keep clean water um, available to your birds. I'll, I've seen, you know, the, the buckets, I know somebody else made reference to it too, because you can buy just the individual nipples and mm -hmm. you can put them anywhere you want. And um, we put them on the bottom of a bucket. And then if it's really hot, you can put ice in the bucket mm -hmm. with the top on it, of course, to keep it clean to keep it from getting too hot, um, you'd have to, of course, be careful with the freezing. Mm -hmm. There are like tank heaters for waters that um, can work in the buckets as well. So there's yeah. there are as many kinds of waterers and opinions about waterers as there are chicken people, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Somebody asked about vaccinations. Do you vaccinate any of your birds? We go back and forth about it. Um, in general, I'm a fan of vaccinations. It's We haven't quite figured out the schedule of it um, because we're hatching over about a three-month period and a lot of vaccines you know, are supposed to be given to the chick at the time of hatch to be most effective, but I have to buy a thousand doses to, to vaccinate 22 chicks. And then I have to get another thousand doses next week to vaccinate another 35 chicks. And so we, when we've purchased birds from commercial sources, we have gotten vaccinated birds. Um, they have been healthier birds by and large than the birds that we've had that have not been vaccinated. This is another very hot topic um, in the poultry community. I am not a veterinarian, so I 
try not to give veterinary advice. I can just tell you what's worked for us. Um, and that's a challenge that we're, you know, a few years in, we're, we're still trying to figure out what the best option is for us. We usually don't recommend vaccinating unless you have a disease situation. Foul pox is one where, you know, if you have a lot of mosquitoes, it may mm -hmm. be something that you need. Um, uh, Newcastle, if it's in your area. But again, trying to vaccinate a diverse age block is very difficult. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, and once you start vaccinating, you really shouldn't stop every bird that comes on there. Merrick's is something you have to do, you know, right at hatch. And if you wait too long, it's too late anyway. So, um, yeah, vaccinations are mm -hmm. a, a debatable question. Because we have silkies, um, right now we have, I think there are 14 silkies in the coop and 110 silky eggs in the incubator, minus whatever hatched overnight. Um, they tend to be more susceptible to merics because they're tiny little fragile special snowflake of birds. Um, so that's, we choose, because we can't, because we don't feel like we can reliably vaccinate, we are very on top of vitamins. Um, they get a little higher quality food than everybody else. And we do add some vitamin supplements to their, to their pen. Just a to... lot of it depends on housing. So if you, Marix is known as the range disease. So mm -hmm. mostly it's a problem if you're, you know, free ranging or outside. So if you have a good biosecurity program that keeps away a lot of wild birds and mm -hmm. stuff like that, then the needs for vaccination go down. Um, once a person said they lost their entire flock to Merrick, so they purchase all chicks and pullets vaccinated. Mm -hmm. And that's a good, that's where you have the problem in the area. And so it's good to do. Um, in Alabama, foul pox is required for 4-H chicks to be able to be shown. So obviously that is a disease in that area. Mm -hmm. um, so, that, you know, it, it, it varies not only from state to state, but within a state, you know, would, mm -hmm. and it depends, are you going to poultry shows or, or are you just keeping the chicken to yourself? I mean, there's so many things that are involved in the decision for that. I did have a couple of things. One, when you, you talked about leaving the eggs over the weekend, um, which is good when you can do that, but it also um, can lead to egg eating. So yeah. if you're gonna do it, you are risking that. <laughs> I did like your comment about the quarantine, although I think, you know, depending on where you got them, I would say, you know, three to four weeks is, is best. And mm -hmm. what we recommend, depending on where you got it, is to quarantine it for a period of time and then take some of the less wanted birds in your existing mm -hmm. flock and put them in with it. Because not only could it bring in something to make your bird sick, but your birds could have survived something that it can give to the new bird. So um, there's a, it's, it's complicated. Bringing in eggs is the safest way. Bringing in chicks is the next safest way. And any adults is, you know, mm -hmm. you're taking your life in your hands. Um, <laughs> uh, as Joe Walter from Florida, I think, said that, you know, the regulations for selling or donating eggs are very state specific. Mm -hmm. So you really have to watch out for that. Um, but one of the things that I'd like to stress is that um, if anybody gets sick from your eggs, you can get sued. Mm -hmm. So that is another thing to be careful about. Um, family and friends don't care if they get sick from your eggs, they'll sue you, so be careful for that. Um, I loved your team sport for egg laying. I was, <laughs> that's definitely a case. 
You might have noticed in the kids' videos, um, they were the surface they were on was a, a blue tarp. Um, that was part of when we had the avian influenza outbreak a couple of years ago. Um, one of the recommendations that our state veterinarian made was to cover any outdoor spaces because wild birds were the primary carrier. And if they, you know, if geese are flying overhead on as they're migrating and they're pooping into your space, then that's transmission, that's a point of transmission. So they've opted to leave the tarp on top of the run um, as ongoing protection since it seems to pop up more, you know, it, it even though it passed your, the primary uh, outbreak, it's not really gone. Keeps your aerial predators away too. That too. Uh, somebody asked about the nipple drinkers. They typically, if you have the right pressure, don't um, leak. That's why they use them to keep bedding dry um, mm -hmm. because that can be a problem with some of the other ones. But we're at four o'clock. I just wanted to make a comment since you did say something about avian influenza. For those that haven't heard in the news, um, it has gone to avian, a, high path avian influenza has now infected dairy cows and uh, they're positive uh, or confirmed positive in Texas and Kansas and th uh, three other states, uh, New Mexico and something else have have tentative positives. Um, and so dairy farms are having to be careful. So it has now passed into a, a mammalian species. Um, it's good for, you know, mutations. And the first two humans have gotten sick from the dairy cows. Nobody has ever gotten sick in the United States from the chickens for high path <laughs> influenza. So it is quite ironic that they are now getting sick from handling the dairy cows and not the chickens. But biosecurity is important on any farm, um, regardless of the species and um, proper handling, washing your hands. I liked how you stressed that every year, starting about now we have a salmonella outbreak in uh, humans related to those that have been handling backyard flocks. So always wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands. Uh, we can't stress that enough. So um, thank you very much, Megan. It was a really good presentation. I really appreciated getting it from a backyard um, flock owner's perspective. And yes, Pam, no chick snuggles, no kissing chick. That <laughs> kids like to do that. No having them on the dinner table before you eat dinner. Things like that. And although you can buy chicken diapers, I don't recommend bringing your chickens inside. <laughs> so thank you guys very much. Let me just check. There's a, oh, somebody had a posting uh, on a bucket. I haven't seen those nipple drinkers before, but. Um, there are a variety of different nipple drinkers you can buy and get installed. They work pretty good. Um, next month's uh, thing I should have checked before I came on to see what who's talking next week. Oh, next week should uh, next month should be really interesting. It's on May seventh, so it's always the first Tuesday, three o'clock Eastern time, chicken psychology and dealing with behavioral problems in a backyard poultry flock. I'm looking forward to that one. See if you can figure out the psychology of a chicken. <laughs> so thank you guys for attending. I hope I see you next month. Thank you again, Megan. It was nice meeting you and nice listening to your presentation. Uh, this um, presentation was recorded and will be available probably tomorrow. Uh, we just got a tornado watch. So um, I'm not sure if how long my power is going to last. So thank you guys for, for coming and everybody stay safe. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye.